Um, first off, I want to talk about why, why we study painted turtles, western painted turtles in particular. Why are they a, an important species? Well, they have an important function in river ecology. First off, they uh, help with energy transfer, um, nutrient transfer. They're important for dispersing uh, vegetation throughout riparian areas. And of course, they're, they're the cleanup crew for, for ponds. Uh, you can imagine if you've got, let's say, a pond with 100 turtles in it, and they weigh an average of 1.5 pounds, you get 150 pounds of biomass circulating through a pond, cleaning things up, um, dispersing root systems. Uh, they actually are, uh, sort of have a critical river function here uh, throughout western Montana and uh, up into Saskatchewan. Uh, one of the um, more amazing things about this species is their cold tolerance. They engage what's called super cooling, so the young hatchlings can tolerate temperatures uh, down to 11 degrees Celsius, minus 11 degrees Celsius, so 12.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and they, they do that by just, just retracting into their shells and their nests and relying on glycogen to, 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 get, to get them through the real cold snaps that they encounter. They don't survive as well if, if water like surrounds them during this time period, then they could freeze. I guess there's a question on with the rain that we had, whether that had a negative impact on some of our nesting sites. Um, but uh, they are the most cold tolerant vertebrate that exists, basically, land vertebrate that exists. They are also the most anoxia tolerant air breathing animal on the planet. Uh, they can dig into the mud and essentially not breathe. The, the, the record is 168 days in the lab. So it's pretty amazing that they can go into mud for five months, or in some cases a little bit longer. Um, what are they doing during this time period? How are they surviving? They're engaging in um, anaerobic glycolysis, so they're breaking down the glycogen uh, that's stored in their, uh, in their uh, liver and in, the, in their other uh, organs. They're, they're also breaking down, mostly it's, it's, it's glycogen, it's like 77% glycogen, and then a little bit of lipids and a little bit of protein. But this is still an extremely long time, and it, how do they deal with lactic acid that builds up? And what this species does is it, it, it sends the lactic acid that it has into its shell. And then in the spring when they emerge after the, after the thaw and the ponds, they, they come up and they can release that that lactic acid. So it's really phenomenal. They, they, um, the, the second most tolerant species in this regard is the common snapping turtle. So those of you that have had ponds that have common snappers in them and you worry about them eating your fish during the winter, it's very true. They can just walk along the bottom of a pond and take a, take a bite out of somebody's fish. So um, yeah, these both species, but this one in particular is, uh, is, is literally the, the most oxygen um, uh, well, it can, it can tolerate low levels of oxygen greater than any other species on Earth. That's a land-breathing vertebrate, right? uh, air-breathing vertebrate. Uh, how many western painted turtles frequent toad ponds? So I'm looking at two different populations, essentially. So we have, in the northern floodplain, we've got some ephemeral pools, toad pond being the main one that I focus on. Um, I know they're, they've come and frequented this area, but of course it's ephemeral. When are they there? What are they doing when they're, when they're there? That's one of the things I'm, I'm looking, looking for. And then especially the population characteristics at the clubhouse pond, because we've got quite a population there. I want to try to understand who's there, why they're there, uh, do they stay there right, during, during their, their time period, um, during the, throughout the year, do they migrate up and down the river. They, uh, the, the turtles can have a a, they can migrate a mile or more up and down the river. There's some records of some males going up to 16 kilometers in Saskatchewan. Uh, but typically, uh, the, the, the females, if they find a good uh, nesting area, they will stay near that area. Um, and then I wanted to think about some of the advantages the expansion of the clubhouse pond provides for turtles and other, of course, other herpetofauna. Okay, toad pond, if you're... Go to the end of, just describe where it is for those of you that don't know, but if you go to the northern end of the property and you're parking by the, the fence post there and you walk down and to your right, um, you walk a bit and there's a, it's about 0.71 acres wetland in June, 
Um, I put a basking trap where that marker is indicated there during June, uh, mid-June this year, this past year. And then I want to talk about a little briefly about uh, the clubhouse uh, floodplain and, and, and how we've changed some things. So one of the things you notice here, this is the, the top picture, of course, is pre-pond pre, uh, construction, and the bottom picture is post-pond construction. You can see this was, I, I remember, was it 2010, Philip, when we, when we first walked along that road here, and we looked in that spring, and there was just a bunch of bullfrog pads just kind of just swimming right over that spring. Uh, and, of course, that spring is now here. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, this area had, of course, a lot of sediment that was um, contaminated from, from lots of years of, of, of shotgun use in the area. I guess FWP, in, in, in combination with Bob, used it as a, as a place for, for people to get ready for the bird season, right? And so there was a lot of a lot of shells, a lot of um, lead, of course, and we wanted to clean this, clean this area up, and we also wanted to just increase wetland habitat. Um, and one of the important things we did was, of course, making this, ma in making this larger wetland, we increased the, the acreage of the pond the, the, around the bend. It's about one acre, and with the, the expansion of the pond, it's 2.5 acres. If you subtract the island, it's two. So we increased the... Uh, the wetland habitat by two acres. We kept it shallow um, with the hopes that it, it, would, it would rise and fall with the river and wouldn't be, uh, become a haven for more invasive species uh, when, when it started to dry up. And what we're, of course, over time, what we, we're gonna need is more organic matter to break down in that area, right? Uh, what's, what's been important that I've seen in terms of uh, herpetology over the past year saw a whole, a whole group of male toads on many, many nights in, in June and uh, er, late June through early July come along and call all through this area and there was some toad breeding along, along that line. And then the, uh, baby, the baby turtles need shallow areas where they can hide, right? So they can avoid pike, they can avoid other, other species that want to consume them. Right? And so those sh the shallow areas that this pond provides with added cover will be a really good turtle nursery for us. Okay. So here's, a, here's another shot of the pond. Um, here's the, the new construction here and the old one acre total area of the, of the bend and the, and the den. Um, one, one thing that's important to realize is this is this south facing slope here that is important nesting habitat for our western painted turtles they like those south facing slopes it was it was a good thing that uh, we, we closed that road along that area because that we could be running over turtle nests um, and also of course the most important Turtles are, in terms of longevity for the species, are the older females. These turtles can live up to 70 years. We know um, a female turtle has to, really just has to reproduce herself once, but it's critically important that she can go and cross a road and lay her eggs without getting hit by cars. And that's, that's of course, a real problem because roads throughout western Montana follow valleys. And ac around the world, um, turtles have been species have been vastly depleted because of, because of cars. Uh, what, what did I do? I, 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 in terms of capturing, I put out what are baited basking traps. Um, typically in the literature I, I've read that you can use basking traps, you can use hoop traps, of course I can catch them by nets, but I thought, oh, well, let's try this one that's actually a baited basking trap and see what happens. Uh, so I would, I would bait them with um, whatever I could get at the grocery store on the way here sometimes. Bologna doesn't work, by the way. It's not really meat, so just <laughs> avoid it at all costs. It didn't break down, it just turned gray. And the tur there would be no turtles in the trap when I put bologna in there. So yeah, I, uh, so other, for, you know, uh, other things that I utilize were fine. Sometimes I put um, bullfrogs in there, uh, but uh, it's essentially whatever I had, and uh, the turtles, the turtles were uh, probably attracted by the scent, but also just 
they, they want to bask. They spend a great deal of time basking throughout the summer. It's an important, they're, a, they're classified as a basking species. Um, so they want to get up on a log and bask. And the important thing for me in terms of placement was to place the traps in an area where they couldn't overlook the trap, that they would climb up on the trap so there weren't logs in the, in the areas where I um, put the traps. Now, in 2013, I placed the traps in three specific spots. Um, and you can see, actually, in the satellite image here, you can see, not the satellite image, but the flyover image, you can see one of the traps there, and the other one's actually covered up there by the red square. But um, there, there are these three, these three areas provided good opportunities to catch the turtles. Why? Well, the bend is pretty, it's a deep area of the, of the pond. Um, and the den, the den is, is where I believe the majority of our turtles go over winter. The reason being it's really nice muddy bottom there. Um, they, they can typically, they'll bury uh, like 95 centimeters into the, into the mud. And they, and they, and they just, whoa, five months later. Um, then they pop up again. But uh, so, they, so I caught, of, of the turtles, twice as many turtles I caught at the den in the traps and in the other two places. But I was still catching them in the other spots as well. The hot spot is one of these, um, one of these zones where I see a lot of herpetological activity throughout the year. As the water recedes, I see, I'll see uh, toads calling there, baby toads hopping there, of course, lots of bullfrogs. I'll see common and terrestrial garters going through there, and, and uh, the, the turtles are pretty active in this area, especially during May. Uh, and then the bend, just because of the depth and they're going around that curve, because they can circulate the pond you know, a, a, couple, a couple times during the day, especially in the deeper areas. They might just kind of zoom on through. So what I did is, um, and many thanks to Alan Ramsey and Catherine for their help with this. Alan helped me construct the turtle database and Catherine helped me with data input here, is I made a turtle database for each of the, each of the turtles. Uh, each of the outer scoots has a corresponding letter um, to it, so I, I take a triangular file and I mark the outer scoots. So this one is B C, right? Um, so each each turtle has a unique identifier. Um, so she's forever B C, at least according to me. Uh, and then I have the date of capture. I put down the the the, the sex. I, I take measurements using a digital caliper, uh, and then I have a digital scale as well. Um, I where I the capture me method, the trap, where I captured her and where she was released, and I note any abnormalities, like uh, BC was missing a nail front left, abnormalities on carapace and plastron, uh, recaptured data, if, there's, if, if it's a recent recapture after this, I'll put that information in there um, as well. Okay, so overall results uh, from the 2012 and 2013 surveys, I marked 89 turtles at MPG, uh, 34 males and 65 females. I had 30 uh, turtles recaptured during this time period. And this is actually my favorite old male turtle. I, you know, part of the problem is I can't, you can, you can, you can look on, and look for keratin lines on the underside of these turtles to try to gauge age, but they often get worn away. So this usually, I can, I can tell how old turtles are till they're about eight or nine, and then that stuff gets kind of scraped away. Um, and so I don't know how old he is, but yeah, he's an, a neat old turtle. Uh, I, to toad Pond, um, again, Toad Pond is an ephemeral pool in the northern floodplain. So I'm not gonna, we're not gonna get the population, of course, that we would have at Clubhouse Pond. And, and what did I see? In 2012, there was a problem with the traps when I ordered them. The geniuses that made them, made them connected the pipes out of water-soluble glue. Uh, so it kind of blew me away, but that, that delayed the trap application until the pond had drained quite a bit. I knew there were, um, there were turtles using the pond. I remember I was gigging with Jeff one night and he found a female laying eggs right, right beside the pond. So I knew they were in there. Uh, in 2013, I marked four females, had one, cap one recapture. I caught three other turtles, but they were too small to mark. I'm, I only mark adults that are, four, well, 
adolescents really, four, four years and older. So um, any, any younger than that, and the scoots are too delicate, and I don't want to use a triangular file on them for her, worry about damaging the turtle. So um, what I'm really talking about are la late adolescents to, uh, to adult turtles. And I had one recapture in 2013. So what this tells me is that females are coming in, right, and utilizing this area to, to lay some eggs. Uh, perhaps males, are, males will come in as well to, to eat some of the vegetation, look for, for good foraging opportunities, and then, and then take off. And I'm not pointing out a turtle to my daughter there. There's actually some toad tadpoles that she was excited about, and I was pointing them out to her. So what about the clubhouse pond? Uh, well, I was trying to get a, you know, an estimate of the adult population based on the, the numbers that, that we, we captured. Uh, I marked 46 adults in 2012. In 2013, I marked 39 adults. Uh, with 24 recaptures. There were some recaptures in 2012, of course, but I'm not counting them in the data because I'm trying to get an idea of the recaptures from 2012 to 2013 to try to get an, an adult population estimate of 121 turtles. That's how it worked out. Um, what about by sex? Uh, 2012, I caught 16 males and 30 females. In 2013, 13 males and 26 females. Six, six of the males were recaptured um, in 2013, and 18 of the females were recaptured. That, if you follow the same formula, the male population estimates at 51, and the female population estimates 73. That's pretty close to the, to the estimate before. So, you know, but why is there this sex ratio discrepancy at the clubhouse pond? Because I. When going through the literature, I saw that like a one-to-one -one ratio is, is fairly common. Other, other studies said that you'd be, it'd be, you'd be more likely to find males and uh, more males. One, uh, only one study I found said that there were more females caught. Um, so what could, that, what could be causing that? And to be perfectly honest, it could be my methods. Um, so I remember coming around the corner looking into the den area, and there was this male up on the, up on the PVC pipe. And he saw me coming and he just went like that and just scooted right off the trap and fell into the water. The males are much smaller than the females. They can, they, the females, given their size, they might just tip over the side of the PVC and fall in much more readily than the males would. So that's one, one um, possible explanation. Uh, another explanation is that males, um, maybe males are, are wandering more often and leaving and the females are staying and that's common that we know that the females will stay especially in a good nesting site and they'll, and they'll just stay in that area. Um, another thing about the males, they, there was one study that showed that they, 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 took, them, they took them and they, they, had the, they had the choice of going to distilled water or water with pheromones from their own pond, and they, they jumped into the pheromones from their own pond, that water source, but if they had pheromones from another pond and their pond, they didn't distinguish between the two. So males will wander looking for uh, good habitat, but again, it probably has to do somewhat with, with the, the method. So this year I'm gonna, try to, I'm gonna try a couple other techniques to try to catch some males that I haven't marked yet. So what about juveniles? Um, it's important to realize, and they, they are adorable, but it's important to realize that they, uh, juveniles' survivorship from egg to one year is 19%, okay? And annual survivorship of juveniles under six years of age, 21% to 51%. So, you know, you know, I probably love turtles as much as anybody, Makes me sad to some degree to think of little turtles getting scooped up and becoming snacks, but it's important to realize that uh, all ectotherms are an, an, an criti critically important uh, nutrient transfer source for a variety of species. So they have really high quality protein. They don't need to waste their protein intake like we do to maintain their body temperature. Their protein intake goes directly to growth. So, you know, they, they eat a bit and they get a little bit bigger. And so they, they've become an important transfer for of, the, of the nutrients from the, the greenery to nutrients from, um, from insects to, to birds, to snakes, to all, all, a host of species to, 
to fish, of course. So even though they have a high mortality rate uh, as they're younger, just like the, the toads do and just like the frogs do, they, they're, they're really critically important for wetland ecosystems. And really, there's no way to mark them. And since so many of them get eaten, uh, you know, I could really the best way for me to probably figure out how many we have is to ga engage in an accurate nest counting study. And that that's can be difficult to do because you, you need to be able to see where they are, try to spot them at night in and, and, and late June. And so I'm going to try to do some more of that uh, this summer to see if I can spot two more nests. I found two nests thus far. Well, the reason I found one nest is because a raccoon had found the nest. But um, yeah, they, they, they're, they're, they can be hard to locate, of course. So we have a problem in the clubhouse pond with invasive species. So we have sunfish, largemouth bass, we've got catfish, we've got northern pike, we've got American bullfrogs. Uh, of course, we've, American bullfrogs, they're one of the, the worst invasive species in the world. Uh, we, there's, there's lots of, there's documented evidence of them eating western, western, western painted turtles. Also, where they have, they've gone all the way up the, the northwestern coast now, and where they have invaded, we've seen a great reduction in western pond turtles, which is a really, a real problem, um, because they just, they, they'll snack on anything, as you know. So we have the American bullfrog problem. Uh, a new problem that I wish I hadn't found was the last year was the catfish, um, or the year before, but they, they've really, this past year, they've really kind of, they're everywhere. And, they, and you know, catfish is a bottom feeder just running along, going through the mud. They, I'm worried that they're going to find those babies and, and eat them. So yeah, if 19% is the best case scenario, I'm worried with all the invasives that we had that we'll have, we'll have more, um, more of our natives being, being consumed. Largemouth bass, they have uh, records of actually the, the baby turtles just biting the insides of the mouth of the largemouth bass after they've been mouthed, and the largemouth bass will let them go. But the problem with the catfish, of course, is they're stingers, so other things are not as likely to eat them, so they can continue to grow and get bigger and just kind of um, wreak havoc on the pond. Yeah, with northern pike, too, it's really a, a pretty potent cocktail, and uh, it's something that uh, we'll be dealing with for quite some time. I estimated that we gigged 1,040 bullfrogs this past summer in the pond, so there's, and there's plenty more. So uh, yeah, we've got, the, the important thing though is, a lot of those were small, they had just morphed. Hundreds of them had just morphed in, in early August. The important thing is keeping the large, the large ones out, because those large ones are the ones that are gonna consume our, our native species. Okay, so plans for 2014, what am I going to try to do? I'm going to try to continue the population survey and collect additional growth data. I want to see how well these turtles are doing over time. Of course, they grow at different rates at different points in their lives, but, you know, I wanted to see, you know, how are they, are they, are they growing well? We're not going to get the size that you will see if you've gone up the swan and gone on hikes along up there. You'll see some really large turtles basking, that's because they, they eat a lot more protein, a lot less vegetable content. Ours are eating a, a, a good mix. Typically, um, the turtles, as they're younger, they eat more invertebrates, and as they, as they age, they eat more greenery. Um, I wanna, I'm going to try to utilize some hoop traps. One of the uh, studies indicated that hoop traps, baited hoop traps, were good at, for um, catching males in particular, so I'm going to try that to see if we can get some males. I'm going to conduct some nest counts, and I'm going to be netting, and one of the things that I know that uh, Tanner put in a lot of uh, minnow traps, it was really invertebrate traps, that ended up catching, being just chock full of, of baby catfish, and I think we just need to have those things going all the time, basically, in order to, to, try, to try to mitigate this impact. And one thing that we, we don't have at the pond right now, and I'll go back to this. Uh, as you can see, just in this photo, we, don't, we, don't, we only have a couple logs here, there, and there's one there, that, that the turtles can access later on in the season. We've got a lot of some dead cottonwoods outside on the edges, but what our turtles really need is they need, they need to be safe. 
because what happens is when they go up on this, they need the sun, and so they're going up on the side of the, the, the banks, and then they're being, they can get picked off by a raccoon easier or something like that. So if we, have, if we add more logs at different depths in the pond, that will help, to, um, to, help to, to give them a safe place to go. The other thing I want to do is, because we, this, of course, this is really new, right? And there's not, there's not that much vegetative cover, and there's not just cover. They need, like, the, especially the babies need, like, nooks and crannies, which they can go and hide in and be invisible from, from predatory species. And, and it's, it's unnatural to have a, a pond without lots of cover on the edge, right? This is what, we'll, so we got to, concentrate on putting more cover on the edge. As you can see, all these logs are out here, and, it, and we're going we're gonna to put a bunch of logs throughout the pond to make sure there's, there's uh, lots of good. And it's not just, you know, basking habitat for turtles. It'll be places where, where birds can, can, can rest and, and hunt and these kinds of things. So it'll be uh, beneficial for species overall. But one of the things, and this is with all the ponds that we're constructing, uh, it's, in, it's really important that we kind of we get that edge shrubbery going, that we get, um, that we have some organic material breaking down on the edges of these places, just not only to provide nutrients, but also specifically to provide places where um, these smaller uh, herpetofauna can find refuge. So, uh, let's see. So, questions? <laughs> 